when back in 1989, uh, the last part of 89, I, I had a contractual deal with a television producer in Hollywood who, uh, uh, who was very, very successful, and he wanted to do a, a, a video on me <clears throat> and possibly put it on, uh, on, on television. Uh, about some of my experiences, and uh, and so uh, we decided we were going to do this, and we and so what we what we did is, of course, you'll probably understand. A lot of people in the audience may not know, but if you're going to do a television show, a really professional one, <clears throat> you do you you first of all storyboard the story you're going to tell. You mm -hmm. write it all out and storyboard it. Uh, and then you collect the pictures and the diagrams and the books and the quotes and everything that you want to present in the video, and you storyboard that. And when you get it all done, then you go into a studio, which my producer already had a small studio in his office in Hollywood with the, that had the equipment that we call offline editing bay. Right. And uh, and that's where you take all of your pictures and documents and everything you're going to present in the in the show, and you record it and put it down on tape and record it uh, professionally, recording it all so it looks good and sounds good. And then uh, when you've got all of that whole one hour or two hour show completely recorded in your office, then you take those tapes over to a really uh, professional uh, online editing bay, which is very expensive, but that's the final cut pro, so mm -hmm. to speak. That's right. the final pro uh, right. production. And so you take the, uh, your, your thing that you've put together with all of the pictures and documents and everything on tape, take it to the studio, and now you're going to put it into the final form before it goes on television. And so <clears throat> we did it in 10-minute bits and pieces. Uh, I worked in uh, my producer's office. His name was Leonard Martinson. And I worked in his office in Hollywood. Uh, it's actually in Century City. And, um, and, and so I put together the first 10 minutes, the introduction, the pictures, documents, etc., uh, for my first television show. Uh, called the naked truth and uh, so when I got the first 10 minutes done because we knew it was 10 minutes because I would walk through it with, well, with myself and him and talk about and, and you know and read and do what you know what I had laid out and it took me about 10 minutes to do it all so we figured okay so we got the first 10 minutes done so we take that 10 minutes worth of uh, of uh, product and go to the online studio and that's where it gets expensive because this is the last and final so we go into the online studio uh, and we lay down the first 10 minutes and that's where all the magic is is done you know with the music and all the uh, all the uh, extra bells and whistles and when that 10 minutes was finished it took a couple of days to do 10 minutes, but when it was finally done, the first 10 minutes was finished and it looked great. And so we thanked them and we made an appointment to come back in two weeks to do the next 10 minute piece. So we mm -hmm. go back and we work for a couple of weeks and get the next 10 minutes uh, of the of the program. And then we go back in, we call them to make another appointment. And when we call to make another appointment, we are told that company does no longer exist. It went out of business. It's out of the city. It's gone. And huh? we drove down. We drove down to the uh, to the to the you know to the location, and all the doors were open. All the windows were open. There were people in there sweeping up and cleaning up. All the all the walls were gone. Everything was gone. Period. Out of the out of the building. Scrubbed. In wow. two weeks. Wow. And so. Uh. Uh, so my, my producer said, all right, well, whatever, we'll just go find another. So, well, of course, in Hollywood, there's all kinds of major big online studios, so it's not, it's not hard to find another one. 
So we found another heart online studio in Hollywood, and we call them and make an appointment. And we go down, big operation, big operation, uh, you know, major production studio in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. And uh, <clears throat> we do the next 10 minutes. And so when we're through with that 10-minute piece, now we've got the first 20 minutes of the, of the show done. Mm-hmm. So then we go back, and we're going to work on the next 10 minutes. And when the next 10 minutes was ready, we call that studio, and they are out of business. They moved out of the building. They're gone. They no longer exist. What? And we drove down there. Windows are all open. Doors are all open. There are no walls. Uh, they moved out. They're gone. It's over. And so... What year was this? What year was this, Jordan? About... This was 1989 to uh-huh. 1990. Right. Late 89 into 1990. And so we find another uh, a, a company and set it up for the third time. And we go in, do that 10 minutes, and when we're ready for the next one, we call them, and they're out of business, gone, Come on. cleaned out. They're not even in the building. Nobody knows where they went. They're just gone, period. And... Uh, and so we found another one. We, uh, so we, we call another company. This is the fifth one. And we went down and did the fifth 10-minute uh, period uh, for, the, for the video. Right. And when we called them to do the final 10 minutes no, of a one-hour no, no, show, no, no. they were gone. Out, no, of the building, no. out, of, out of the building, nobody knows where they went. They are gone. How did you uh, find so, these, these companies? In the Yellow Pages? Uh, uh, well, the thing is, uh, Jeff, these were five major, well, uh, well-heeled, uh, highly successful television and motion picture, uh, you know, studios <clears throat> with uh, millions of dollars in equipment and online equipment. These were very well-established wow. uh, houses yeah. in, that Hollywood and television uses. Mm-hmm. All five were out of business, out of the building, and nobody knows where they went, and they're gone within two weeks of each other. Five of them. So I don't know what that tells you. I'm just telling you what happened. So I'm totally sure that somebody in the spirit world did not want me doing what I was getting ready to do. Well, yeah, I would say don't take it personally, but you have to take that personally. Oh, yeah. 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 And so it became very obvious to Leonard and myself, and Leonard even said that. He says, somebody is giving us a message. Wherever we go to do a little bit of work, whoever helps us is gone off the planet. They're out of business completely. So well, what, does that su- what does that suggest? Does that suggest that maybe these companies were already Intel or are are backed by Intel, uh, that Hollywood is an Intel operation. We know that pretty much. But to to pull a company apart like that, that quickly, five of them in that period of time is almost, it defies description. That's really astonishing. And I'm wondering if, if they were government, if they were Intel, no, I could see it. That's how you do it real quick. You just you pull your assets and you go. But if these were privately owned companies, they would have had to have been threatened uh, s- more severely than I can even imagine or paid off or something if they were privately owned companies. Yeah, now, if they were intelligence owned... operations, something else. But But what was absolutely phenomenal, in my opinion, is the fact that they weren't even uh, a chair left in the building. Bizarre. Every time we went down, the building was wide open, open for uh, for rent, totally open with all the doors, windows all open. Nobody's there. Period. Two weeks ago was a major. Uh, did you Did you company. ask anyone around there? Yeah, we asked. I said, "Well, where did they go?" And they said, "We don't know. They just went out of business overnight, and and within the last week, they just pulled all the equipment and gone. We don't know where they went, and we don't Jeez. know what's the world. They're just gone." So you got five ten-minute segments. Yeah, and, and each one cost a major corporation uh, to go out of business within two weeks. What happened to that video, Jordan? Did you finish it? 
Yeah, well, I, finally, I finally finished it. Uh, but uh, that's hard a whole to believe. story. In it. Say it again. It's hard to believe. I mean, if they wanted, if they wanted to stop you, they could have done something more severe. Well, you would think so, but <laughs> I'm glad they didn't. But this is this is absolutely bizarre. It is. And today, if you talk to my uh, talk, talk to my one, you know, my longtime friend, my producer, yeah. he's in uh, Orange County. He still yeah. has a big uh, production company down there. Uh -huh. We still talk about that. He's still shaking his head. He said, "I have no idea how to explain what happened." Wow. The five major production companies in, in Hollywood that were very, uh, you know, very, very I gotcha. impressive. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. And they're gone. Just, oh, this is one of the strangest things I've ever heard. Uh, just totally gone. And nobody knows where they went. Nobody knows where the equipment went. It's <laughs> all open, wide open. They're sweeping out the place and waiting for a new uh, wait for new renters Tenet. because they're just gone. How strange. How really bizarre. Wow. Yeah. Did, the, did the video do well? Uh, it did very well, and uh, but there's a whole story to that that we'll have to get into one day because it was, uh, you know, it was sabotaged. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, it was sabotaged, but it still did well, uh, you know, considering mm -hmm. that it was sabotaged, but it still did pretty well. And that's a whole other story. But you know, uh, Let me say something to our listeners here about Jordan. If you don't know Jordan, Jordan Maxwell is without question uh, – responsible for the careers of probably more people in the so-called alternative occult conspiracy field than you could imagine. His work has been pilfered, borrowed, stolen, uh, and reworked. By, he literally has created <laughs> the careers of probably a couple of dozen people, some major, some minor, who are who are known commodities maybe more and how many films how many well look at national treasure right I that's right know. it's just nutty nutty national treasure and uh, uh they even called me uh on, on national treasure uh two the second one and wanted me to do a cameo appearance in it and i turned them down they called me the first one they called me on the second one i turned them down I wasn't interested in uh, uh, National Treasure 1 and 2, but also the Da Vinci Code. Hmm. I myself was actually startled at that because in the very beginning of the movie Da Vinci Code, uh, Tom Hanks is in an audience and he's sitting in the audience, but he's got a speaker for the evening. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the host gets up on the platform and they've got a slide presentation and there's a slide projector and is projecting a, a picture on the screen and the speaker is saying we have with us tonight as a speaker uh, uh, the world's foremost uh, expert on the secret societies and occult emblems and and I thought that's rather strange who has that title <laughs> and uh, and then he comes up uh, uh, <clears throat> Tom Hanks comes up on the platform and he's standing talking about uh, something, either the dollar bill or the, or the pyramid on the dollar bill or something. Right. And and but but he's also standing in the projection in the line of projection. Right. So some of it's being projected on him as right. he's turning around and pointing <clears throat> to these different symbols. Uh -huh. Well, that's exactly, precisely, exactly out of my. Uh, my first one of my first videos where I was in the audience, I was introduced as an authority of oh, secret societies and, yeah. and, and symbols. And then I went up and they turn on the projector and it's projecting on me. And I turn around and I'm pointing at the screen. That's precisely the same well, they, uh, you know, uh, picture uh, in the Da Vinci Code. They borrowed your, your video <laughs> and, 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 and ran with it. Yeah. Well, and then I came out with a book called, uh, you know, what was it, um, Matrix, the Matrix, uh, the whole idea of the Matrix of Power, mm -hmm. uh, showing the secret societies who are operating around the world mm -hmm. and how they're using uh, uh, high technology to manipulate the human mind. And then a few years later comes uh, a movie, Matrix, talking about the same thing.
And so I've had so many friends in the motion picture and television industry, writers and researchers, uh, tell me in private conversations, uh, yeah, we've used a lot of your stuff, Jordan. You, uh, we, we used you in, uh, in um, the, uh, the idea in Matrix. Mm-hmm. We used your, your concepts in uh, National Treasure, etc. And, uh, and I, my, my comment was always the same. Well, strange, I've never gotten a check from anybody. Nobody ever sent me a check. <laughs> so, uh, but that's... Uh, well, I, I offered uh, you a cameo. Let's not get greedy. Uh, you turned it down. Gee. Well, I turned that down, yeah. That's and funny. So, now, uh, that, who was in those movies? I can't remember the guy's name. Why? I can never remember his name. I know. I that know. Actor. I like him. I like him, too. Uh can't he remember either, his name. He's made a few <laughs> interesting films and a lot of bombs. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, anyway, he lives, uh, he lives in... It. I think he lives in Las Vegas now. I'm not sure. <clears throat> but anyway, so I told my, I told my producer about uh, about the prophecies that that had been given to me by Kenny Kingston and other other yeah, you know, world famous tell us psychic. again about that for our listeners who didn't hear it before oh Kenny's you, prophecy about Kenny about the prophecy Kennedy Kingston gave me yeah yeah well i was at the uh <clears throat> stop me if you want anywhere but um i was at the uh whole life expo that our dear friend Uh, uh, Paul Andrews was putting on in 1989 and uh, it was a big huge uh, convention of new age uh, people and things they were big uh, things back then uh, oh yeah in LA oh big 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 and so I was walking down the aisle in this big convention big expo convention and I see this table where Kenny Kingston uh, is supposedly the world's foremost psychic, uh, and he's called the psychic to the stars. Yeah, and uh, and I talked about this before, but I'll I'll give it to you quickly. Nicholas yeah. Cage. Oh, Nicholas Cage, exactly. That's him. I really like Nicholas Cage, but yeah. uh, but anyway, do you want to hear the rest of this? Oh yeah, uh, I, it's a great story. I think it's worth repeating. Yeah. Okay. Well, so Kenny Kingston. Uh, as a psychic, and at that point, I didn't care much. I don't really didn't know much about psychics and what they do. But he had a lot of pictures at his table of him with famous people, mm-hmm. and so I figured whatever it is that he does, he must be good because he's got all these famous people from the Queen of England to all the big shots that run the world, right. and, and with Kenny. And so uh, I found out well, what he does is he gives you prophecies about the future and, and you know and, uh, personal prophecies mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, as a psychic and so I and so he had a little sign that says to buy a tape or a little track that he had written for ten dollars and he would give you a one minute uh, complimentary psychic reading to show you what he can do uh-huh. so I, I bought the little track and I was standing there reading and uh, and you stand waiting for your turn, yeah. and uh, finally my turn shows up. And his back was to you, right? Wasn't that? Yeah, it his so? back was to me. He's sitting yeah. at the uh, at the end of the table because there's so many people, you know, in the yeah. aisles. You can't take up room in the aisles, so you stand real close to his table, and uh, and then when when it's your turn, you go to the end of the table, turn around, and Kenny, and then Kenny will talk with you, and so. The the person ahead of me had already gone and talked to Kenny, and I was holding up the line, just standing and reading this pamphlet. And so when I it, it finally occurred to me to look up that I'm holding the line up, uh, Kenny was in the process of turning his chair around. He has a swivel chair, and he turned his chair around to see if somebody was holding the line up, which I was, and our eyes met. And the moment I, our, our eyes met, he pointed right at me and he said, you have come back. They have brought you back. <laughs> and I said, me? And he said, yeah, you. <laughs> you have come back. They have brought you back to expose religion and, and government conspiracies. And he said, you're going to make some of the most powerful enemies a man in this world can make. But that's what you've been given to do. That's your job. You've been brought back to do it. Wow. Hold on a minute. We have to pause. Uh, Kenny was on the program several times, and what a, a, a gracious, 
nice, fun kind of a, a personality. Just oh, he was eff wonderful. effervescent, and just really a nice man, and talented too. All right, very. Jordan and I will be right back. Okay, and back with all of you and Jordan. Okay, Jordan, next. Uh, so anyway, <clears throat> that was uh, that was that, and, and so I had I, I had told my producer Leonard Martinson about Kenny because Kenny and I became very close friends, and I used to do uh, uh, openings and introductions for him at his. At different uh, lectures, etc., I would introduce him. Nice. And so I nice. told my producer about Kenny, and my producer knew even less than I did. And so I told him about what Kenny does as a, as a psychic and gives uh, prophecies, psychic readings, etc. <clears throat> and so I, I was telling my producer, and I said, if ever you get a chance. Uh, Leonard, I said, if ever you get a chance that where you see a psychic fair. Uh, where there are psychics, they say, I said, why don't you just uh, go to a psychic fair just to see what happens? Couldn't hurt, and and uh, and and talk to a psychic and see what they say. And he said, okay, well, I'll keep that in mind. And so a couple of weeks later, he had to go to. Uh, he was in Los Angeles, but he had to go to Florida uh, to Orlando, I guess it was, where the Motion Picture Studios, because he had an office there. <clears throat> he had an office in Florida. So he told me, I've got to go to Florida for a couple of days, and I'll see you when I get back, and I'll call you. And so he called me the next afternoon, and, and he said, you're not going to believe it. He said, uh, when I got into Florida uh, last night, I checked into just the closest hotel, and in the lobby was a big sign there having a psychic fair in that hotel the next day. And he said, so when I come down this morning, I had a little time, uh, and there was a psychic fair going on, and I just got through talking to you a couple of days ago about a psychic fair. So he said, so I decided to uh, to get a psychic and see what you know, see what happens. So he said, all the the readers, all the different psychics were there, were busy, except one young man uh, by himself, and he said he really looked very shabby. He was not very well dressed. <clears throat> but I figured if he's there, he must be or he must be a psychic. So I don't have time to wait. <laughs> so he said. So I took this young guy, and he said he absolutely blew me out of the chair. He knew everything about me correctly. Mm -hmm. He knew about my business, my my partners in Europe, my marriage. He said there was nothing this kid did not know about mm -hmm. me. And he said, and he really got my attention. And then he said to me, and Leonard's telling me this over the phone. Yeah. And he says, and he told me, right now you are doing a video production with a man whose uh, initials are J.M. That's all I know. I don't know his name, but his initials are J.M. And you're doing a video with him. <laughs> and ultimately, ultimately, you will do five videos. But you're doing one right now. And Leonard said, and then he said to me very seriously, be very careful around this man because both God and the devil are involved in his life. Wow. Be very careful around him because both uh, God and the devil are involved in his life. Mm -hmm. You don't know it mm -hmm. and he doesn't know it, but... Mm -hmm. Be very, very cautious around him because there's a lot of strange stuff going on around him, and God and the devil are watching him. And I thought, well, 
I don't know what that means. I'm just telling you what he said. But uh, but I come to think that there may be something to it, even if I don't understand it. Well, I just thought that was interesting. And, That's fascinating. Um, Some of those people are, are really gifted, or whatever you want to call it, but they, they can see. Oh, yeah, and it's just amazing. They're remote amazing. viewers is what they are, the good ones. They're, yeah, very. Yeah. And so... Uh, <clears throat> And back in back when I was working at uh, the uh, in San Diego for the Truth Seeker Company, um, I I had a two bedroom condo, and uh, on Fridays on Friday afternoons my friend uh, uh, Tim Leadham T I M Tim Leadham uh, was the editor for the book I was working on. Uh, we will work on this book with Steve Allen, the musician comedian Steve Allen. Myself, Tim Leadham, and uh, and quite a few other authors. And I didn't so we, know you worked with Steve Allen. Oh yeah, Steve was a very close friend of mine. Yeah, he was on this program very shortly before he was taken from us in that crash. Weird. Oh yes, crash. yes, I know about that. Yeah, he knew. I, he knew exactly what oh. you know about where it's all going. He knew. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And uh, I used to go to his home. And uh, and and he was so incredibly brilliant, but so over. He was so nice to me, always so very cordial and so very nice to me, and I really appreciated his friendship. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> I had a two bedroom, as I said, a two bedroom condo, and uh, and on Fridays, Tim Leadham, who was our editor for the book. Uh, would come down and stay with me on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and then go home on Monday back up to uh, Los Angeles. And so we were working on the book every weekend. Well, one one weekend, Tim comes down. He's staying with me, <clears throat> and in the middle of the night, I'm I, I, in the middle of the night. Uh, I woke up, but I didn't open my eyes for some reason. I woke up. I knew I was awake. And I was hearing fire. I was hearing a fire, crackling of fire. But I, I, instead of opening my eyes, because I had just woke up, heard the crackling of the fire, and I was concentrating on smelling, if I could smell smoke. Uh, and I, so for a few seconds, I just concentrated on trying to see if I was smelling smoke with the fire I was hearing. Uh -huh. And I wasn't. There was no smell of smoke. <clears throat> And so I opened my eyes, and when I did, I let out a yell at 2.30 or 3 o'clock in the morning. I, I let out a yell. It scared me, uh, and it woke up uh, Tim in the other bedroom. Uh, when I opened my eyes, there was an angel. I cannot describe it in any other way but a typical, uh, incredible, large angel standing, uh, looking at me, and it was touch he was almost touching the ceiling, but he was he had incredibly gorgeous wings that uh, and the light emanating from behind the wings was lighting him and his whole body with the wings, wow. lighting it up in such a way that it was absolutely gorgeous, beautiful. And but it scared me because when I when I opened my eyes, the fire that I was hearing was a was a uh, the, uh, the angel had a sword, and he was pointing the sword, holding it and pointing it right between my two eyes. And so when I opened my eyes, it was a sword uh, of fire. There was no blade. There was a f blade of fire, and it was crackling, and that's what I was hearing. And, but, it wasn't, but it wasn't burning. It was, a, it was just a, a blade of fire. And, and it frightened me, and uh, then uh, then when I jumped and sat up, looked at this angel holding this uh, 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 sword of fire, the sword uh, the angel picked the sword up, brought it up between you know, in front of him, brought it up in front of him, and then slowly but surely disappeared. Little by little, he just kind of dropped off until it just disappeared. And at that moment, uh, uh, Tim comes into my bedroom and flips on the light. And he said, what was that? And I said, Tim, you're not going to believe what I just saw in my bedroom. And I told him it was an angel with a sword of fire. 
and it was pointed right between my two eyes, and it scared me to death. And since then, I know that this was exactly the way uh, you know, pictures and books have, have pictured the Archangel Michael. I don't know what I'm not. I'm not verifying anything. I'm not chiseling anything in stone. I'm just telling you what I saw. Right. And what I saw was an angel with a sword of fire pointed directly at me huh. and frightened. Did but, uh, uh, did your yell wake up Tim? <laughs> my yell woke him up. Yeah. Oh yeah. Because well, I really, it really scared me. Yeah. Did he and come I in just, right away to your room and knock on the door or anything? No, no, and so Tim, because the door, our doors were open, uh-huh, and so uh-huh. he came in to flip on the light to see yeah. what happened to me. Yeah. And, and just as that angel was disappearing slowly but surely disappearing in front of me, and by the time he got up, put his uh, shoes on, and came and uh, uh, slippers on, and then came into my room uh, and flipped on the light, and I was sitting there on the bed, sitting straight up, and uh, and I and. I'm Tim said, what in the world you know, was that all about? And I said, Tim, you're not going to believe what I saw in my bedroom just now. So I have seen, I don't, I can't verify, you know, what it is, what the phenomena was, whether mm-hmm. I was just, I don't know. All I know is what I saw with my eyes. And uh, <clears throat> it was a while after that, I don't know how long after that, but in that same condo, uh, during the week, it was, I was there by myself. One night, I was sound asleep, and uh, and uh, this is in San Diego, Rancho Bernardo area. Um, sound asleep, all of a sudden, and in, in, in a dream, uh, an angel appeared to me in a dream, and he and they said to me, uh, "Get up and go in the bathroom. Your nose is going to bleed." And I remember thinking to myself, why would you tell me that? And so I said in my dream, I said to the angel, I don't understand. What are you talking about? And the angel said to me in the dream, the angel said, look, at, get up, go into the bathroom. <laughs> Your nose is going to bleed. And I argued with the angel. Uh-huh. I, you know, I, I, re- I remember doing that. I argued with him and said, why? What? Uh, explain to me, why is my nose going to bleed? And the angel said, listen to me. And he put his hand out to like to flick his finger. And he clicked his finger and said, get up, go to the bathroom. Your nose is going to bleed. And I woke up. It was like uh, uh-huh. I, and he woke uh-huh. me up. And when I woke up, I, uh, all I remember is that this, there was an overwhelming feeling. Get up quick and go to the bathroom. Your nose is going to bleed. And I jumped up and ran into the bathroom, and on the counter were two boxes of Kleenex. I pulled them out, and I looked in the mirror, but not, but nothing was happening. All of a sudden, the blood started pouring out of my nose, and it's poured out so bad, so quick, I felt dizzy, like I was going to, oh. I was going to faint, mm-hmm. because I was losing so much blood so quickly, and I was amazed how much blood was coming out of my nostril. And I know there's not that much blood in your head, and if you lose too much blood, you're going, you know, you 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 might as well die. And so I said, I said loudly, I said to the spirit, I said, God, stop this bleeding, or I will die. I it don't was, want to die. Stop. It was that bleeding. much. It was it was that much blood. That's a lot it of blood. It was that much blood. I couldn't even. I was just trying to huh. hold back. With uh, grabbing just whole handfuls of napkins uh, to my nose, wow. and it was still just pouring out. And I, mm-hmm. I said to, I said, God, if you are hearing me, stop this blood because I will die. And it started to quickly stop. It started to to lessen and lessen and lessen, and I finally got it down to where it was just a normal bleeding. And then huh. a few seconds later, mm-hmm. it stopped. And I looked in the in the bowl in the in the uh, in the sink bowl <clears throat> with all of the tissue and blood just uh, you know surrounding it, mm-hmm. and I had lost so much blood I got weak, and I could finally I finally got back to bed enough and just laid down and went right back to sleep. The next morning I could see boy there was blood all in that bowl, 
and I had really bled, you know, but I don't know what to make of that. All I know is that the angel told me, get up, your nose is going to bleed. Left now, nostril, right nostril. Yeah. Both? I don't even remember. Mostly, mm -hmm. I do remember the, the left one, but I think it was coming mm -hmm. out of both. But but then when I talked with uh, my friend, Dr. Lear, Roger Lear, on yeah. the uh, implant doctor, and I called and talked to him, and he said, well, it sure sounds uh, suspicious to me because I know what implants do. And he said, uh, I, it may have been somebody was putting an implant in, yeah. but it sounds more like somebody was taking one out of you. And, and they knew that the, it would cause bleeding if they pulled that out. <clears throat> I don't know. I'm just telling you what happened and what uh, Dr. Lear's comments were. What did I, the I angel look? Them. What did the angel look like, Jordan? Like the other one? Again? What did the angel look like? Like the other uh, one? It was a nondescript face, but the one thing, uh, it was a beautiful. Actually, it was very, very beautiful. Uh, it was um, uh, mostly a pastel, not any hard colors. Right. But a very faint, beautiful pastel color, but there was a nondescript face. I, I looked at the face, but I, uh, but the one thing I real, realized the moment I saw it is it was not male or female. It was not, uh, it was not man or woman at all. It was an entity, uh, an angel, and but you couldn't tell uh, the description of the face. Mm -hmm. And uh, but. So when I hear people talking about they've seen angels and Angel Gabriel and all of that, I think to myself, yeah, I know. I've seen the Angel Gabriel myself. Mm -hmm. uh, or uh, Michael, the Archangel, is mm -hmm. the one who is... Yeah, that's, uh, that's but, one of the uh, biggies, yeah. Yeah. Well, then when I go back and think about what uh, Kenny Kingston said and what this kid in Florida said, both God and the, and the devil are involved in his life, uh, I have no idea how to understand any of this. I'm just telling you what happened. Well, this is interesting because, as we know, uh, those who study this, the idea of, of alien ET uh, implants are usually uh, done up the nose, one side or the other, sometimes both, and there can be uh, significant bleeding, but not like what you're talking about. And maybe they did pull something out. That's what I. That's what I kind of suspect is that the spirit entity we call huh. an angel may yeah. have pulled something out and realized that it was going to bleed, uh, and, and and possibly bleed badly. So yeah, uh, and have to go prepare. You know. Well, I remember when you were down there in that that condo on Rancho Bernardo, and the foundation, and. Uh, what was your name? Bonnie? Bonnie? Yeah, Bonnie Lang. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Bonnie Lang. Uh, there was one, there's another, I think we got a uh, time for we one. Five one or six minutes. minutes, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this thing happened to me twice in my life. Uh, once in, in uh, Los Angeles, downtown, and once in Hawaii. The first time was in Hawaii. Uh, back in 1968, 69, mm -hmm. I went to Hawaii for the first time with, uh, with some neighbors and friends of mine, and we all took a vacation to Hawaii, my mm -hmm. wife and myself. And uh, we were sitting in a restaurant right across the street from the Hilton Village, from the uh, Hilton Hotel, and... Uh, and it was, a, it was a big hotel there, but we were sitting in the ground floor restaurant. And uh, I had my back to the front door. Uh, so anybody coming in, I would not see them. But somebody came in the, the, the front door, and there was an electrical shock as if somebody had plugged in a wire to the wall, uh, having it open on the other end and touch you with it when you're not expecting it. Ouch. And you're getting shocked. Yeah. But, it, but, but getting shocked un, un, unexpectedly is a real shock because it's bad enough if you're working with electricity and you get shocked, you know, you, know, you, you had it coming. But if you're, sound, if you're talking with other people and having breakfast and somebody comes up behind you and hits you with two live wires, uh, that's a real shock. Well, when someone came in the front door 
the electrical shock went through me so fast and so hard that I knocked over food on the table and fell uh, fell toward I fell backwards, uh-huh. but I didn't fall over. And there was food knocked over, the water and everything was knocked over on the table. And I in uh, I un um, what's the word I'm looking for? I did not decide to do anything. I was forced to do it. The voice in my head said to me, get up and get out of here quickly. Your life is in danger. Run quick. Mm -hmm. And so I got up and I started running. And I ran across the dining room and the voice said, go out the back door. Go out the back door through the kitchen. And so I ran through the kitchen. There was the back door. I hit the back door. I'm out on the parking lot behind the restaurant. And the voice said, run quick, you're in trouble, your life is in danger, run. <laughs> and I was running, and, it, and, it, and it, was, it was having me run toward the street. And the main street in Honolulu is a very wide main street uh, that goes through downtown. And so I was running into that street, and there was, you know, it's, uh, it's very, very crowded with, with, uh, with traffic. And so I yelled uh, to the spirit or whoever it was that was doing this to me, and I said, I can't run. If I run into the street, it's, uh, I'll be killed. And they said, no, you will not be killed. Run into the street. Well, I Jeez. have no choice. Wow. I, I, I had to. I did. It was involuntary, I guess you would say. Uh, I did not volunteer to do this. I, was, I just was watching myself doing what I was doing. And so I ran into the street, uh, <clears throat> frightened to death, but I, I, I couldn't do anything but that. So I ran into the street, and just so happened that when I hit the, uh, the street, there was a break in the traffic, and there was about a half a block uh, back with the cars coming. So I had uh, plenty of time to cross the street uh, without, without any problem. And then it said, run through, run through uh, the restaurant. And there was a Benny Hanna's restaurant right on the corner. I ran behind that, and the voice said, run quickly. Your life is in danger. And it Gee. said, run around to the front of the, run around to the ocean side of the hotel. Well, that's right. the Hilton Hotel. Right, right. So I ran around to the uh, ocean side of the hotel, and then the voice said, you're all right now. You're safe. Settle down. You're okay. And there was a, there was a park bench there. And the voice said, sit down at the bench. You're okay now. You're safe. And so I sat down and, and trying to catch breath, my breath, and wondering what in the world did I just do? And what is the reason for what I just did? Did you ever find out? No, but I have a suspicion. I think that I'm here at the behest of someone, and there are enemies here who know who I am, and uh, and I'm not ready to do anything with them yet. I'm not ready to, to confront whoever these enemies wow. are. Wow, this, this voice in your head was a, uh, a very clear, unambiguous, very. booming voice. Yep, it, it was commanding a very you. clear voice hmm. telling me, one, your life is in danger, quick. <laughs> 